of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, let me do a short introduction. So Professor Joram Brasley is a founder professor of engineering with the departments of electrical and computer engineering and bioengineering and the coordinate, uh, coordinated science lab at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. So his current uh, research interests include machine learning and statistical sig signal processing and their applications to inverse problems in imaging. So he is a fellow of IEEE and MBE. Um, he, his papers received several awards from the IEEE Signal Processing Society, and he has served as an IEEE Signal Processing Society Distinguished Lecturer. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I will turn the mic to Joram. Um, so. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jane, for the kind introduction. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And today I'd like to talk on two topics, both related to deep learning for image reconstruction. So the first one is about a physics-based scatter correction for computer tomography. And the second one is more generic, is about adversarial training for improved robustness, but again in deep learning for image reconstruction. So the first part of the work is uh, work by Burke Iskander, uh, my student here at the University of Illinois. And uh, here's a brief outline for this work. Uh, we'll talk about computer tomography, X-ray scatter. So if you are not familiar with that, I'll provide all the necessary background. Then we'll talk about conventional scatter correction methods about the forward problem, which is scatter modeling, about the inverse problem, how you estimate scatter from image measurements, and then how you can use deep learning to do scatter estimation correction. Uh, what we think is special about our approach is that it's physically motivated, both in terms of constraints and structures, as well as a loss function training scheme. Uh, this work uh, has appeared in part in ISB 2020 at the International CT meeting uh, again this year, uh, but there are some new results that have not been published yet. So first, X-ray CT. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. So we have uh, different geometries for X-ray CT. There is fan beam, there is a cone beam, and then there's parallel beam. So parallel beam does not arise in too many applications. It does arise in synchrotron imaging, but it's the easiest to analyze. Uh, so therefore, most of our theoretical discussion and modeling will be on the parallel beam case, but I'll show results also on uh, combine CT. So where do we use X-ray CT? Of course, in medicine, uh, CT is the workhorse for medical diagnostics, but also in non-destructive testing, to examine electronic boards, uh, metal castings, and so on. So uh, CT is widely used in many areas. The main idea is that you can look inside an object without actually opening it up. The problem is that the one that we'll study here is X-ray scatter. So ideally, X-rays travel in a straight line, but when they uh, encounter matter on the path, they get scattered. You see this in the orange lines. And therefore the measurements, rather than being the blue lines on these uh, line plot, uh, look more like the orange line. And that leads to a reconstruction which deviates from the truth. And you can see that there's modified contrast if you compare the left and the right image, there's modified contrast. And there's also streaks, but we don't see them at this level of uh, the gray level display. Uh, known artifacts caused by scatter include what is known as a cupping artifact. So a uniform region becomes non-uniform. Uh, the shading artifacts, which you see on the right uh, side of the slice through the body and streaking artifacts. So it's a major source of problems and we'd like to correct it. Uh, one thing with I should mention, people may be familiar with medical CT and you know that you get fantastic CT scans at a hospital and seems like scatter is not a problem. We'll see how that is actually handled and why that method is not generally applicable. So first, conventional CT, we have an object f of xy 
we have an X-ray source, which in this case we'll consider a 2D monochromatic pile beam source at a particular energy. So the photons are shooting all of them at one particular energy. And if you have this scenario, then the mathematics is very simple. The mathematics of the forward problem. So we have line integral projections. That's ideally what you would measure, which is the 2D rayon transform of the object. Uh, but what you actually measure are the primary measurements described by Beer's law. And those correspond to the air measurement. So I naught is what you measure if there were no object. And then the lines, uh, the rays are attenuated exponentially with G being this line integral. So uh, why does that happen? Again, because photons are lost as they travel in a straight path and the loss is due to Compton, to Compton scattering, Rayleigh scattering, photoelectric effect. So Beer's law is a simple model that allows us to compute what we expect to see on the other end of the object. And the reconstruction is equally simple because this, there, we have this simple exponential relationship. We can take the log that gets rid of the nonlinearity in the problem. And now we have G of T and theta, which is linearly related to the measurements through the radon transform. We invert it. And a good practical inversion algorithm is the filter back projection, which I'm sure you're familiar with. So we'll assume that the filter back projection is good enough for our purposes, the sampling is dense enough, and so on. So that's a good approximation to the inverse rate of transport. So this is the ideal scenario with a linear model for the measurements after taking the logarithm. What happens in practice? So in practice, some of the rays get scattered as they go through the object, and rather than traveling on a straight path, they get deflected to a different locations so that some points on the detector, we get measurements which are not described by Beer's law. So instead we have scattering, which causes changing direction and energy of the photon. And the total measurement, uh, tau here, can be described as the ideal measurement, the primary measurement, which is described by Beer's law, plus an additive term, which is the scatter. And that scatter is a function of the view angle and of the position on the detector. So again, uh, we'll be referring to these terms. So we have the total measurements. These are scatter corrupted. We have the primary measurements, which is the measurement given by Beer's law. And then we have the scatter component, which is a nonlinear function of the object. So the re reconstruction normally proceeds as if there were no scatter. So again, you take the logarithm, but this time, in addition to the exponential term, we have the scatter term. And therefore, when we take the logarithm, we get nonlinear effect due to this additive scatter term. So we get a distorted version of the reconstruction because our estimate of the primary is also distorted. Okay, so that's what happens with scatter mathematically, simple nonlinearity due to this nonlinear presence of the scatter. Again, we've seen that this will cause degradations unless you try to correct for it. Well, scatter is not a new phenomenon. It has been uh, with us forever since the first days of CT. And there are many hardware-based solutions. So one is anti-scattered grids or collimators. This is actually what is used in medical CT. So there is an anti-scattered grid, which is very effective. So the scatter becomes almost a non-issue. But it requires modification of the hardware. So uh, that's an issue. It increases the scan time because you have reduced uh, exposure, some of the x rays absorbed by that scattered grid, grid, and then also requires increasing dose. So, recently, there has been an interest in software based schemes. And the idea is to estimate the scatter from the object. And that can be done using either Monte Carlo methods, and we'll see how those work, or analytical methods. Or you can try to estimate the scatter in the projection domain, and there are again kernel based methods and recently data driven scatter methods. Um, one problem with grids, which is not applicable to con beam with flat panel, is that you'd have to have a grid which is oriented with arrays. So that's difficult to do. And also the grid uh, would take a significant part of the area of the panel, would reduce your quantum efficiency. So that's why with con beam CT with flat panels, a grid is usually not a practical solution. So our method, the proposed method, is actually data-driven scatter estimation from combined projection and object. 
Uh, so how do software-based methods work? Many of them are based on the following iterative scheme. So we start with some scatter estimate, maybe our initial estimate of S is zero. So we do a reconstruction using the total. And we assume that this is as good as the primary. We take the log, invert, get an estimate. From that estimate, we now have initial estimate of the object. We use a scatter forward solver to estimate the scatter. So the forward solver in some function phi, get an, a new estimate of the scatters, correct for it and iterate around the loop and hope that this converges. So there's no theory so far to show that this converges or even has this fixed point. But in practice, if you have a good forward modeler for a scatter solver, actually this scheme seems to work pretty well. The issue is how do you actually do the scatter modeling? Turns out that this is a difficult uh, problem because the scatter uh, to fully model it, you have actually to shoot photons through an object. And one way to do this is a Monte Carlo based uh, scatter computation. So there are um, software packages, heavy duty software packages to do this Monte Carlo modeling. So that's one approach. And there has been work on doing scatter correction using such a Monte Carlo techniques. The problem is we have a trade off between runtime and noise in the estimate. Uh, because you need more photons to reduce the noise, and that's expensive. Actually, it can take hours to do a simulation. An alternative is uh, the linear Boltzmann transport equation. So it turns out the expected value of the scatter is modeled by an integral differential equation. So in principle, if you were able to solve this for a given object and given uh, source and detector configuration, you would get a solution. It's faster than Monte Carlo, but still there's a trade off between accuracy, discretization, number of iterations. This integral differential equation is uh, an equation in the seven dimensional space. And again, very heavy computation. There are some clever methods recently to accelerate it. But again, this is slow and not practical for a real time imaging solution. There's another method called the slice by slice approach, and we'll encounter that later. And the idea is just to model first order Compton scatter, which is a dominant scatter. So you assume that when your photon goes through the object, it hits an electron, gets deflected, and there's only one such deflection. Now we have to consider all possible positions for every photons to be deflected. So that still requires some computation, but turns out that that can be modeled by distance depending on blur, blur and kernel that compute the propagation of X-ray from one slice to another perpendicular to the direction of the rays. Okay, so that's this uh, slice by slice approach. This has lowest accuracy of all these methods. So there is one arrow going to faster methods, but uh, the more accurate methods are more expensive. On the other hand, there are other methods which just take some version of the total measurement apply some transformation to it and get a scatter estimate. In particular, recently, uh, a method called DSE has been proposed, deep scatter estimation by Meyer et al. And that method uses a neural network. So you train a neural network end to end, you provide total measurements and you ask it to estimate the scatter and you do it projection by projection. So you fit in a projection and you get a scatter estimate and you train this using training data, which you can generate by Monte Carlo or by measurements with ground truth. And that's a method to which we'll be comparing. So the method that we have, um, what are the new features? So it is somewhat similar to the DSE method. It is based on deep learning, but it incorporates both scatter crafted measurements and an initial reconstruction of the object. So in that sense, it does not just operate on the one projection at a time, but instead incorporate the entire set of projections in the form of an initial reconstruction. And then we use physics motivated constraints. We'll see that the architecture is inspired by scatter physics. And for training, we use a physics adapted loss function. Now we'll be operating on normalized quantities. So everything will be divided by this I naught, which is the measurement uh, with just an air in the path. 
And that normalizes things so that the result will be applicable for different I naught without retraining. So here's the idea. We have an initial estimate, G tilde of the line integral projections. Uh, we constrain them because we know that the primary measurement cannot be bigger than the air influence. So that's one physical constraint we use. We do an initial FBP reconstruction and we get a reconstructed image. We take that initial reconstructed image and rotate it to the view angle so that uh, when, once we look at a particular projection, rays going straight through that rotated image will correspond to that projection on which we're operating. So we're operating on the data projection by projection here, but we're also using a fully reconstructed object rotated to that same view angle of the projection. So we take care of the logarithm, so we undo the logarithm, but we know that it's gonna be a nonlinearity left. And that's where we rely on the neural network to undo the nonlinearity and give us an estimate of the scatter. But that neural network has this nonlinear distorted projection, but also has this full initial reconstruction, which includes the data for all the object or all the projection. We subtract out the scatter estimate to get our estimated primary. Again, we know that it's non negative, so we can threshold it, take the logarithm, and get our estimated line integral projections after correction for scatter. Uh, so, some nuances here. How do we train it? So, we have a loss function, and that loss function. Uh, has two components. One is the L2 norm between the ground truth, line integral projections, which we can have in training, and the estimated uh, uh, line integral projection here. And this is two norm over uh, just one projection. Okay, But then we have here a filter. And this filter H is special in the sense that we can show that by a clever choice of this filter, this metric actually corresponds to image domain error rather than projection domain error. So we'll see in a minute how that works. Plus we have an L1 term, turns out that H is a high pass filter, very simple two tap filter. Uh, so in order to recover also the average the mean, we add an L1 penalty term. Furthermore, we use here post log quantities. So we use here the line integral projections in previous work. The DSE method used the primary projections, the pre log, and turns out that that makes a big difference because we actually care about error in the image domain, and that's linearly related to the recovered line integral projections. So, what about the filter H? So, the filter H relies on an analysis which shows that you can calculate the two norm of an image by calculating a filter two norm of the projections. And you can show that using Parseval's identity in the projection slice theorem. Q is some filter, arbitrary filter that you can pick. We pick a high pass filter to emphasize fidelity to edges. But it turns out that there is a lucky coincidence. If you pick uh, your filter in the reconstruction of the Shep Logan filter, and you pick up your high frequency emphasis at the square root of the frequency, you end up with a very simple filter, just a two tap filter. So this is what we use and that's easy to implement. The advantage is that you don't need the filter back projection in the loss function. So although you want to optimize error in the, in the image domain, you don't need to explicitly do that and you don't need to have FBP and do back propagation through that and so forth. Instead, we have the simple cost function here with this filter, and that takes care of actually penalizing reconstru image reconstruction error. Okay, so we have a neural network, and here's the structure of the neural network. At the high level, uh, here's what happens. So we have our projection, corrupted projection, we take the log of that, that's one channel input. Another input is the rotated image, and we put input that image as the other set of channels to this uh, neural network. Now the network is designed to do convolutions along the T-axis, which is perpendicular to the propagation of the ray. 
and do contraction along the path of the ray propagation. What that achieves is something similar to the slice by slice method for scatter modeling, although this is not explicitly that, but in that sense, we believe that this is physically motivated because uh, scatter tends to spread things along the T dimension to spread things along the perpendicular axis to the projection because rays are scattered perpendicular to the direction of projection. And then things accumulate in the direction of ray propagation. That's why we have this contracting structure. So this are our neural network. And after we scratch our heads for a while, we came up with another uh, idea. So remember in parallel beam uh, CT, opposite views are identical. So if you have rays going in parallel through an object, doesn't matter if they go from this side or go from that side, all you have is just a flip of the projections. So we use this fact that projections that are shifted by pi radians are really just flick in the variable t and we denote them by a hat. And then if we look at the total measurements, those are the primary projections, which are exponentials in these uh, g's, plus scatter. And then if we do the, the flip, the pi rotation flip, we get cancellation of the primary measurements. And what we end up is a difference of the scatter. So this shows that by taking opposite projections, although they're corrupted by scatter, we get an exact recovery of this difference of scatter components. So the only thing we're missing is the sum of the scatter components. Now, why is that interesting? If you look at the difference of the scatter components, this is very oscillatory, high frequency, and therefore we hypothesize that it's more difficult to learn that and embed this in a neural network that will recover such a highly oscillatory signal. On the other hand, the sum is writing on a big DC component, so it is mostly dominated by low frequencies, and that should be easier to learn accurately using a neural network. So the scheme will be to recover the difference just by differencing opposite views, and that mathematically should give us the exact difference, and then only try to estimate the sum of the scatter. So this leads to this modified diagram where we input sums of uh, opposite views flipped and then differences. And then the neural network produces the scatter estimate of the sum and then corrects for it. And we have a similar recovery, similar loss function. Okay, and then a neural network, which now has these channels of both difference and sum of opposite views. Okay, so how do you train this network? Uh, ideally, you'd have an actual scanner where you could do many experiments and you have objects which are exactly measured and you know their composition. We did not have access to that. So instead we did our data generation experiments using Monte Carlo. So we used uh, the gate package, which is a big computing package, which encapsulates another uh, bunch of simulation libraries. And we're able to compute simulation of scatter in CT we used, we generated random phantoms with objects in them, which are uh, water cylinders, aluminum cylinders, steel cylinders, had a number of uh, training uh, phantoms and a number of uh, validation and test phantoms and used that for the study. So here are some examples of results. These are for the 2D problem and the way we simulate 2D problem, our objects have symmetry along the rotation axis. So there are essentially all the objects are cylinders or prisms. So there is no variance along the Z axis. So we can use that to get essentially the 2D problem. Okay, so here's an example. There's a ground truth of a slice. This is a recovery without correction. You see that um, the intensities are quite off. This bright spot is reduced to something uh, quite dim and small. And this is the reconstruction error, the difference between the recovered and the ground truth. So the reconstruction error is quite large and you can see this on this line profile uh, where, the, where the blue is the correct one, that's the primary. 
reconstruction from primary measurements, whereas the red is reconstruction, reconstruction of total measurements. And you see that uh, there is a maybe 150% error in the reconstruction itself. So large errors. Next, we have the DSC method, which operates by neural network, but slice by slice and doesn't have any of our physically based tricks. And it still has substantial error uh, shown here in the difference image. And you see that also in the line cut. Remember, we had two algorithms. One worked on single views, one, one worked on opposite views. So that's the proposed opposite view algorithm. That's the proposed single view. And with the opposite view algorithm, we still have, we have greatly reduced errors. And you see that also in the line cuts, but there's still some difference here on the top of the spike. This is largely mitigated by this opposite view processing. So this seems to work. Quantitatively, we also see that here's the PSNR. So without correction, we have something like 31 decibels. DSC gets us up to 37 decibels. The proposed single view scheme gives us uh, almost 44 decibels. And then we get extra improvement, improvement of about 2 dB using the opposite view processing. Again, SSAM metrics show, tell a similar story. Uh, the mean absolute error here actually shows that the opposite view processing doesn't do better. Uh, but we think that's mainly the choice of the parameter lambda, the L1 penalty, and that probably could be tweaked to get comparable or maybe even better results for the opposite view processing. Uh, here are results in 3D, so we repeated this in the 3D scenario, still parallel beam scenario, but we have an object composed of many pieces inside this 3D cylinder. And the story is similar. Uh, so the uncorrected image looks like this, has a fairly large error. With DSC, you reduce the error shown here in blue. Uh, but with the proposed schemes, you reduce the error further. And this is also seen here in the line plots. So this seems to work. Our next experiment was to go to cone beam. And here we took uh, a semi-anthropomorphic phantom. <laughs> Let me tell you what that is. So we took... Um, CT data and ran it through code that extracted the composition, segmented the image into fat, tissue, bone, several components. And then that was used in Monte Carlo simulation to create data. Okay, and here's the reconstruction error without correction with a lot of yellow, meaning high values of error. And you see this also on two line cuts. Uh, big gap between the blue, which is what you should ideally get with just primary data. But then once you have scatter, you get these larger errors. And then here are the results of the algorithm. And uh, the error is greatly reduced. So the error is shown on the same grayscale or color scale as for the uncorrected, but you see substantial reduction. And this is also validated by these line cuts. So this seems to also work for combi. Here, we did not have algorithm two because we could not process opposite views, at least not trivially, because opposite views are not just flips of one another in a combined geometry with divergent ways. So how to use this opposite view processing for combined, this is still something we're working on, possibly a rebinning scheme, rebinning to uh, what is known as con-parallel or, par or parallel might help. So this is still an open question. So in conclusion, scattering in x-rays produces various degradations and those can be very significant. And then we show the data-driven approach with physics-motivated constraints and also physics-motivated architecture and cost function. And all of that seems to work. Uh, a caveat here, all of this was done for monochromatic uh, case with polychromatic uh, data, as uh, many of you know, you also have the other effect known as beam hardening. So you have to mitigate that as well. So we left that for future work to combine both scatter correction and beam hardening uh, correction at the same time. Okay, I see here a uh, question. Uh, yeah, so there's a question here, uh, whether we suffer from 
photon starvation because of uh, the log pre-processing? Very good question. So obviously from an expert. So once you have low photon counts and you have a uh, few photons when you take the logarithm, for example, you take the log of one, one photon, you get zero. So you can end up with uh, extreme values. So we use the usual tricks, which is uh, put a floor on the quantity for which you take logs. So when you take the log of the prior of the measurement plus some epsilon to keep things from uh, hitting unreasonable values. Interestingly, the neural network learns also to correct those effects. So the neural network also learns to denoise at the same time, it learns to estimate scatter. So somehow we get the benefit here of the neural network correction that is able to correct also photon starvation on the fly. We did not intend it to happen, but that seems to also be happening. Okay. Uh, let's switch gears to a different piece of work. And this is motivated by the following fact. We just showed what we believe is a fairly successful and, and promising uh, application of neural networks to image reconstruction. And there's been a lot of excitement uh, in this area. Many people have worked on this. The NIH uh, has posted this as a, the future of uh, image reconstruction or the future of CT and so on. Uh, recently though, it has been shown that deep learning can be sensitive to perturbations. In particular, it can show instability to, of the combined system to adversarial attacks. And this raises the question, can we really trust and rely on these methods? So yes, we showed something that seems to work for scatter reduction, other people have shown those reductions and so on. But are these methods safe? Do you want someone to cut your head open based on diagnostic obtained using your neural network? And we'll see that maybe you wanna scratch that head before they cut it open, before you decide that you actually wanna go that way. Uh, but not everything is lost. We think that there are some ways to fix the problem. So in this piece of work done by Ankit Raj, uh, also a student, here at Illinois, recently graduated. We propose a min-max formulation to build a robust neural network model. And part of that model is to introduce an auxiliary network to actually generate adversarial examples. And then we train in the presence of such examples and we achieve improved robustness. Uh, this is difficult to analyze theoretically, but we're able to analyze a simple case of the neural network. And it shows actually that this formulation does mitigate the effect of adversarial examples. So here's an image from a paper uh, by Anton Nadal on instabilities of deep learning in image recon and potential costs of artificial intelligence. Okay, so here's the scenario. We have measurement AX, so A is some linear operator, for example, the one in CT and MRI and so on. These examples are for MRI. And then um, if you perturbed X by some small perturbation, which may not be visible. Okay, so on the top row here, we see the original image and then some small perturbations added, R1, R2, R3. And those visually are make these images are indistinguishable. Yet, once you apply Deep MRI, okay, so that's a, a published network which uh, generated quite a bit of excitement. On these slightly perturbed images, all kinds of artifacts arise. For example, they can be as bad as this bunch of stripes, uh, which result only from a tiny perturbation in the image. Well, tiny perturbation, but cleverly chosen. So this is the attack, the perturbation is chosen by maximizing the difference between the reconstruction by the neural network F uh, from the ground truth by maximizing R, max maximizing this difference over R being the perturbation. And here we penalize the size of the perturbation. Okay, so that's Antoine's work and that's how they found these nasty perturbations that are very small, but can lead to a large error. Okay, so this gives you pause in using these uh, neural networks to do image recon. One question is, 
that we asked when we started looking at this, where should you model the perturbations? Should they be in the X domain, in the object domain, or in the measurement domain? In the work by Anton et al., they actually perturb things in the image domain. But we think that this is suboptimal for inverse problems for a few reasons. One, it constrains the perturbations to be in range of A. So if you're doing a compressing sensing problem, range of A may be deficient. So you're not able to model all possible perturbations in the measurements. And then for ear conditioned measurement operator, even if you had an ideal inverse, it could be highly vulnerable to even small perturbation measurement space. That effect would be totally missed in the X space formulation, which is what has been studied by Anton et al. Furthermore, the perturbing the image in the X space cannot capture mismatch between A using training and a wrong A, a wrong measurement model. Okay, so we wanted to capture that. And therefore, we do the perturbations in the actual measurement domain. So here we have a delta which perturbs the measurement. And what we would like to do is the following. I'd like to find theta, which is the parameter of the neural network, to minimize the expected value over all images subject to a perturbation delta to the measurement. And what we're doing here, we're, for every image, every x, we are finding the perturbation match to that image. Okay, so we're finding a really worst case perturbation. So that's the ideal framework for adversarial training. This is the problem we'd like to solve. The issue is that it's very expensive during training because for every training sample x, you have to solve a full optimization problem to find this delta. Okay, so this is what you want, but this is hard. Okay, so here's a suboptimal approximation. The trick here is to switch the max and the expected value. This time, we're finding the worst case perturbation that maximizes the error, the average error. It's tractable in training because you don't have to find a different delta for every x. But then it's finding only a perturbation common to many training samples, basically to all training samples. And it's not ideal then. Why? Again, because the perturbation is one which is bad on the average for all samples, but that does not allow you to find a sharply tuned perturbation, which is tuned to each image specifically. So this is a much weaker attack. We'd like to do this strong attack, but practically this seems to be what is achievable. To get around that, so before we go there, actually what we want to achieve is perturbation specific to a sample. Okay, so we want to solve this problem for each sample. And the idea is to model this perturbation itself using a deep network. So which would be a function of the measurement data and some extra parameters. And this approach eliminates the need to solve the inner max that we had previously using the handcrafted method. And we don't need to solve it for every x. And since the, this g is parameterized, once we learned it, it can generate strong perturbations. So have, yeah. I have a question. Yes. So when you're talking about perturbations, does it make sense to only consider the worst case perturbation or near worst case perturbations? It is possible that these perturbations maybe are a set of measure zero in their space, in, in the ambient space. And so, and maybe in practice, they are very unlikely to happen. So is, can you give some insight on you know, can we sort yeah, of yeah. categorize what yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah. This, this is a valid uh, criticism. And at the high level is whenever you do min max or a solution, you're going to be conservative. You're going to consider the worst case perturbation. And the question is, should you protect against the worst case? And you, maybe you want to protect kind of on the average. You don't care if the system fails, you know, there are, uh, you know, 8 billion people in the world, okay, you fail on a few million, so what, right? Uh, well, we don't think that. So we want a method that is guaranteed for every instance to do well. So we want to protect it against the worst case, right? We don't want to take the cynical approach that will say, well, we'll be okay on the average and um, you know, physicians are not perfect either. We want to take the engineering component of this to at least be reliable and to do our best for every case. So that's kind of the philosophy behind the worst case analysis. 
what we'll see is that we actually don't pay much in performance or not at all. And this actually turns out to work well. But that's definitely a, a valid uh, question. Okay, so here's our modified objective. We have G which generates the perturbation. So that's our network, our attack network. And now we're maximizing over the parameters of G. So now instead of tuning a perturbation for each X, we're tuning the parameters for the attack network so that it will generate strong perturbations for every X. So the generator network gets to see the measurements and then it is trained simultaneously with the recovery network F to generate strong attacks. And to actually solve this minimax problem, we formulate it with a penalty on the perturbation so that the perturbation is bounded as we want. We want, want only to consider small perturbations. We have this adversarial term for the recovery error. And then we also want to make the reconstruction without perturbation, want to make that good. And this is this term which says, yeah, you know, we want this to work well when there are no perturbations. And we can weigh the, the relative significance of these using these uh, this lambda parameters. Okay, so the training schematic is, is uh, like this. Here we have our attack generator, which has its parameters phi. We take the measurements, add to them the attack. Okay, so we, uh, we generate from them the attack delta, take the measurements y in the, this path, perturb them, and then we get the adversarial solution, adversarial, adversarially perturbed solution using F. Then we have the F from unperturbed data, and we try to minimize the difference between these two. And we train both F and G to achieve good results. Um, I will skip this for reasons of time. So we were able to analyze theoretically how this would perform uh, for a simple linear reconstruction network where we let F only be a linear reconstruction. And it turns out that the solution is uh, sort of a, an SVD regularized solution. So it's not exactly truncation of the SVD, but it's some uh, kind of um, fil SVD filtering using a particular formulation here that results in actually mitigating the sensitivity of the inverse problem. We have a robustness metric, which is again the reconstruction error, deviation from ground truth, subject to perturbations. And we compare it to end-to-end -to -end training, no regularization, to L2 norm regularization, that's a standard regularization method for neural network, that's weight decay, and to something more recent, which is Parseval networks. So if you design your network to have each layer be a Parseval frame, that will limit the Lipschitz, will constrain the Lipschitz constant of the entire network and therefore, theoretically, this should limit the sensitivity to perturbations. Okay, so we compare it to this network solution as well. So your examples are on the standard MNIST uh, case, true image on top with normal training and perturbations. You see various uh, deviations like on the digit two here, on the five, and so on. There are various errors. The Parseval networks does better, but still, uh, there are some errors left, whereas the proposed method seems to do pretty well and overcome all the perturbations that are seen in, in the other cases. Uh, here's an example of the Celeb A data set. Again, true image is, is on top. Uh, both normally trained the Parseval networks uh, suffer uh, from various uh, deviations here. Okay, and this is uh, compressed sensing scenario. So we're sensing the images with the Gaussian uh, measurement matrix with a compression ratio about 10, 10x. And uh, on the bottom, we see the results for the proposed methods with regularization or with adversarial training. And it seems to overcome uh, the perturbations and, and uh, errors experienced by the other methods. Some quantitative results. So here is the, on the vertical axis, you have the error metric, what kind of error we, do, we have on the average due to perturbations. On the horizontal axis is the strength of the perturbation. And we see various, all the various methods have of course error increasing as the perturbation increases, but the one, the network which is adversarially trained does better than all the other methods. Notice 
that even when the perturbation itself is actually zero, we do better than the other networks. So what's going on? You'd think that to achieve this adversarial robustness, to be able to do well in the worst case, you'd sacrifice something, that things will not be as good when you have no perturbations. But this turns out not to be the case as shown here. So what seems to happen is that adversarial training also improves generalization. And of course, in retrospect, that makes sense. Uh, you're training actually on a larger training set because you're including perturbations and you want to overcome them. You can think of this as training with negative examples and that improves generalization and we see an improved effect. So in fact, we don't pay a penalty for this worst case training. We in fact have a benefit. Somewhat similar example for a more ill-conditioned uh, compressed sensing matrix, a submatrix of the DCT. Again, fairly substantial differences between the adversarially trained network in red and the other solutions. Okay, also did this for CT images. So clinical CT images, which were reprojected to generate CT data. And then we do the recon here uh, using FBP ConNet, uh, which has been, is a published method. So we used their code and compared what happens with when you train that network normally or when you train it adversarially. And normally trained network with perturbations has various uh, errors. Uh, you may see here stripes next to the yellow arrows, whereas adversarially trained network uh, overcomes these perturbations and gives good results. Okay, so um, while MNIST and Celebe are kind of toy examples, these are examples at much higher resolution bigger images, and we still see the same benefits in this more realistic scenario. Something I'll not have time to cover is a different kind of error. What happens if you have actually valid small structures in the data, in the image, that you want to recover? Turns out, and this is again data from Anton et al., that if you have this original image, and here's a zoom in with some small detail, a neural network recovery lost the small detail where there, whereas a state-of-the-art method based on sparsity was actually able to recover this. The question is how can you fix the, this neural network? So we have a fix for that as well. And another similar uh, formulation with an attack generator, but this time the attack generates valid small features that are required to be recovered. And here, just in this final image, this is a zoom in on MNIST true image. A very small feature here, this small uh, one pixel component. It's recovered with the network trained adversarially, but lost in a network uh, which is trained conventionally. And this is for 8x compressed sensing. So the take home that conventionally trained networks are, are vulnerable, but by using um, adversarial training, you can overcome that. You have to be efficient how you do that. We did that using an attack generator, otherwise solving the inner optimization problem is impractical. So in conclusion, deep learning uh, does offer new opportunities for image recon, but there are also new risks. In the first part of the talk, we saw some opportunities in solving a highly nonlinear inverse problem where even solving the forward problem is normally very expensive, requires Monte Carlo or heavy duty uh, numerical sol uh, solvers for integral differential equations. Instead, with a simple neural network, which generates solutions actually in two milliseconds per slice, that's the timing that we have, you can get quite interesting results, huge suppression of the scatter, but there are also risks, okay? and We've seen that the structure of the forwarding inverse problem can inform the effective design. We've seen that in the scatter reduction problem. But then we've seen that we need a systematic and principled approach to robustness. I think this is essential for using such methods in mission critical applications. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks a lot for the great talk. And uh, there is still um, a couple of questions. Um, so I saw that uh, Robert has raised his hand. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so would you like to actually uh, talk to the speaker? Uh, I can allow you to talk. So, uh, so Robert, uh, you can actually unmute yourself and uh, talk. Okay, so, so if there's no question from Robert, I will uh, move on to the question and answer box. So uh, Fernando uh, has one question and Fernando, do you want to talk or just, uh, I should go through the question. Okay, so I will go through the question. So does the generalization problem with details also affect the previous scatter correction method? Yeah, so that's a very good question, right? Uh, the talk has two parts and one wonders about the connection between these two parts. That is, we have this uh, wonderful scatter correction method based on neural network. Did we try to attack it? And uh, the answer is no. And we would like to do so, but one big challenge in that problem is that to generate examples, we have to use Monte Carlo. And that Monte Carlo is very expensive. So to run an optimization loop around the Monte Carlo is something we haven't figured out yet how to do efficiently. Uh, so that's, that's a challenge that uh, comes with problems where the Ford problem is very expensive. Uh, and and non-linear, because if you have a linear problem, you can add the perturbation and it's simple. But in this problem, um, we have a non-linear problem. So we have to actually run the full Monte Carlo if, if you want to be faithful to the physics. And that is difficult. So something for future work. I had a further thought on that, Yoram. Yes. So I think that brings up the interesting question of like, if the perturbation is, is in, in, in the system is sort of a function of the object rather than being completely independent of the object. Mm -hmm. If it's independent, then we could use sort of the, the algorithm that you have where you just bound the perturbation and, and sort of scroll through them. But if the perturbations are a function of the object, then that becomes sort of much more challenging. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that that for scatter to be realistic, you'd have to consider the fact that there is coupling. So suppose you have a perturbation in the object itself, uh, then photons scattered from that perturbation interact with the rest of the object. So what you'll actually measure will be nonlinear related to your perturbation. And therefore, so one might consider linearization so the uh, LBT, the linear Boltzmann transport equation is a linear equation in the source, but it's a nonlinear equation in the object, highly nonlinear in the object. But one could possibly linearize around nominal point for small perturbations. Yeah, so we have various thoughts about how this might be addressed, but uh, yes, definitely a topic for future work. Okay, so I, I actually have one more question. Uh, uh -huh. So um, for the min-max uh, problem for the GAN, do you encounter any like instability when during the training, like it diverges sometimes or? Yeah, so, so uh, that, that, that's where you go from the science to the art of machine learning, right? So uh, how do you train? So this is not exactly a GAN, but it, it's still a min-max formulation and uh, for those, it's, it's hard to uh, get the, the scheme to converge and uh, converge reliably and so on. So uh, there are various uh, schedules. So you have to come up with the inner outer loop. So you don't necessarily uh, do both the inner and outer updates on every iteration and you do more of one kind than the other and that helps uh, stability. Similar to what has been observed in GANs where uh, you have the, um, you know, the, the, the two parts, the, 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 uh, the critique and, and the attack generator, 
and you don't update them at the same rate. You use different update rates or different learning rates for the two, and you schedule, you do, you do this many cycles of one and another number of cycles of the other. Uh, so that's the art, and that's where, of course, uh, the work of, of uh, Ankit uh, went, you know, we spent quite a bit of time to getting this to work well. So I don't know that we have a, any breakthrough in the theory of training uh, min-max type solvers, but this was more of using the tricks of the trade that people have written about and published and um, tuning the learning rates and so on. Uh, one theoretically interesting point though is the following. So we generate the attacks in the inner loop uh, using this network, uh, G, which we learned. So let me, if I manage. Okay, so we have this uh, minimax problem. So we have G, which generates the, the perturbations, and we update phi. Now, your perturbation will be only as strong as the capacity of your generator. So if you design a weak generator, if your neural network for the generator is not deep enough, you, you know, maybe the perturbation you generate will not be as strong. Uh, the other extreme would be to remove this G and just directly optimize a delta here, a perturbation. But that's expensive because that involves, uh, you'll have to switch the expected value and the max and do it for every sample. Now, if you update uh, the phi, if you update the promise frequently and you don't worry about G actually converging, you let it float as the training samples come in, you actually let, let it change. What happens is that you adapt G to a batch of training samples. So it generates a worst case perturbation, it learns to generate a worst case perturbation for that particular batch. For the next batch, G actually may change. That's fine, because that means you're allowing it to tune an, e, an even stronger perturbation, even more closely matched to that batch. So in this, from this perspective, we did not need G to fully converge. It was okay for it to fluctuate uh, throughout the training as long as it's generating uh, strong perturbations. So that's kind of a, a nuance here, which is different from what you want in again. Because in again, ultimately the G is your object that you're left with, the discriminator you throw out. But uh, here it's the opposite. Here the reconstruction network, F is what we care about. G is the thing we throw out in the end once we're done, done training. Mm -hmm. So that, that's kind of, it's, it's a, a dual problem here. I see, thanks. Um... I saw one Hi, Ken. question. Uh, uh, okay, uh, here. Okay, can I ask a question? Can I ask actually two questions for Joran's uh, before you move to the audience question? Sure. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so you're uh, behind here. I just, I'm, I'm just very curious about the second work. Like you, you showed that this adversarial training can actually help. I mean, surprisingly, you know, you, you already yes. pay a lot of penalties for you know for reconstruction. So you showed that even for you know, without perturbations, you, you have a yes. better qualities than others, right? So I yes. guess maybe the reason here is that, I mean, for for the reconstruction network, it's, it's, more like a, it's more like a discriminative model rather than a generative model. So that because of, of, of your training data limitation, it's, it's kind of a useful to have this adversarial training steps to really make it generalizable for a, a particular tasking data. But but I'm, I'm just curious, for, for the same purpose, people also try other type of uh, you know, other approaches to increase the, this kind of generalizability, such as they can either do, you know, some kind of data augmentations by maybe not considering uh, the worst case attacks, but they also just considering, like, say, general noise, right? Mm -hmm. But how, how, how does this uh, adversarial training uh, compare to those, you know, just, just increasing the natural robustness by introduced noise? Do you have any comment on this? Like, uh, have you tried? Yeah, no, yeah. So, uh, so, yeah, no, no we, we, we have not compared, but if you introduce noise, noise is random. So the noise mm -hmm. will not be tuned specifically to each example. And uh, I think it will regularize. So we look, for example, at weight decay. So weight decay, uh, at least for a, neural net, for a linear network, will be equivalent uh, to, I think, to adding noise because it essentially damps your, uh, your weight. And you see here that weight decay didn't do much. The Parseval network, which constrained the Lipschitz constant of the entire network by constraining each layer to be a Parseval frame, 
that does help. And I suspect that uh, some of these other robust approaches to achieving robust networks will help, but they're not specifically designed to work against adversarial attacks. Remember, here is on the horizontal axis, we have the magnitude of an adversarial attack. So we have not tested those other networks that are trained for improved generalization with adversarial attacks, but here we specifically train with adversarial attacks. So I think that's about as well as you can do. But of course, uh, it remains to be seen how much we gain over those. Is the gap as large as we see here between, for example, uh, the weight decay and the red line? Huge gap at, at epsilon equal three. Do we get similar gains compared to other schemes? I don't know. Yeah, good, good thing to try. All right. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so let's look at the question from the audience. Mm -hmm. So uh, one question is by Ray. So um, uh, let me see. Uh, Ray, do you want to talk directly or I should just uh, go through the question? So I just unmuted, uh, like allowed you to speak. You can unmute and talk. Um, okay, so if you're, um, so let's, let me just go through the question. So are stripe artifacts actually more predominant than other, uh, other shapes like rings or squiggles? Could it be that uh, humans notice the stripes more yeah, that, that's, that's an interesting uh, idea. Uh, so, you know, th this is the work that I showed here is, is from Antonio uh, We didn't generate these. Uh, the stripes are, I wouldn't say that you have to make an effort to see them. You'd have to make an effort not to see them. So I don't think it's a threshold detectability question that humans can see stripes better than rings. Or, or other artifacts. I think they just, uh, it so happened that there are stripes here and these are very dominant. Uh, I'm not sure what, I don't remember actually what uh, acquisition mode was used for these MR images. For example, uh, if you have um, multi-coil acquisition with subsampling in one axis, you tend to get spatial aliasing, which could manifest as these rings. So there may be some, some things to do with the actual uh, inverse problem, specific inverse problem as to why those stripes were generated. But uh, in the first, uh, in the second image there, are, are there artifacts pointed by red, by red arrows, which are not stripes? And if you're not a physician, maybe those would not call your attention immediately. But I'm sure that, that physicians Anything that's abnormally in that in anatomy will they'll notice. In fact, gross artifacts such as these stripes sometimes are able to tune out because they know that there's not anything physical or anything anatomical that they can expect. And it's the more worrisome is maybe such a small black dots which would maybe appear uh, like a tumor, and they can masquerade as something which can be possible physiologically. Okay, so I, it seems that there's no more questions. So uh, let's thank the speaker again. I, um, I have one more. Uh, oh, uh, sorry, you have one more question? Yeah. Okay, sure, go uh, ahead. So Yoram, do you have thoughts on how training adversarially, I mean, I think the comparison here is to like pure supervised training of networks, yes. right? So how would this compare to like the unsupervised learning as in GANs? Um, yeah, I don't know. So this is a game. Uh, I'd say we've just taken a dab at it, a first step. We've shown that adversarial training can help overcome some of these instabilities, which I think is encouraging. In the sense, you know, after you see these uh, images from Antonio Rao published uh, in this pre prestigious uh, uh, forum in the PNAS, uh, you kind of say, hey, Maybe I should uh, change my profession and stop doing uh, recon using neural networks. 
And we, I think, have shown that now not all hope is lost. There are some reasonable engineering approaches that can mitigate these problems. But uh, I think that the field is wide open. We have only studied one scenario, like you described, uh, supervised training. What will happen in unsupervised training? And we don't know. Thanks, Yoram. I mean, I, I really enjoyed the talk. Thanks for the talk. Thank you. So, uh, so our speaker for next time is Van Kat from Oak Ridge uh, National Lab. So on December the 1st, and also uh, for uh, November the 23rd to, uh, to the 24th, we are co-sponsoring a workshop on seeking low dimensionality in deep neural networks. So uh, please go to the website and register if you're, you're interested. Um, okay, so let's thank the speaker again and uh, thank you for participating in this webinar. Yeah, thank you very much and uh, I appreciate the great questions. I guess we, I have now my plate full for the next two years to try to answer these questions. Thank you. Thanks.